Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful. Good morning. It's wonderful to, to be here. Um, this threw me. Just the... <laughs> the <laughs> I, was, I don't do well with change. I was very confused when I walked in. I feel like I've got a long arc of, like, people. I talk, yeah, I talk, I'll walk across. It is exactly the same, but it's different. Good morning. It's wonderful uh, to, to be gathered together. I'm really excited um, to, be, to be able to start our, our new sermon series today, working through the book of Revelation. Um, like Adam said, I, I don't know what your, your kind of thoughts or um, if you've had any kind of preconceived ideas of what it is that we're going to be looking at as we come to look at this book, this, this book written by John to the churches in Asia, seven churches that we're going to be focusing on. I don't know if you've read Revelation before or tried to read Revelation before and kind of stopped because it got a little bit weird or got to some of the imagery and the, the analogies that it uses and kind of been slightly confused by that. I, I think I just want to say, don't if that is you, don't feel bad. If you've started to read Revelation and just been confused and kind of stopped, uh, I think the majority of people have been there at some point. Um, I, I was talking to somebody, and they, they equated uh, the, the book of Revelation kind of to when you have something recommended to you as something that somebody else has really enjoyed, like a box set or something. I don't know if you've ever been the person that, like, somebody else has come up to you and been like, oh, you need to watch this. It's so good. And then they have, and they've kind of come back and been like, oh, I don't really get it. Like, <laughs> what, what was, I don't really get what the fuss is about. Like, oh. Okay, okay, fine. Like, or if you've been the other way, if you've recommended something to someone and then been really disappointed when they've come back to you and been like, oh, I didn't really enjoy, I didn't really get it. Like, what was, well, that, somebody was saying that's that's kind of what Revelation can be like. This book that is is this this wonderful expound of who Jesus is and what he's done. This this book that's meant to lift our eyes. It's okay if you've started it and thought, ah, oh, I don't really get it. Like, this is hard. What we want to do is we work through the next 11 weeks. We're going through the first five chapters of Revelation. We're looking at Revelation 1 to 5, the majority of which, there's a, a large chunk in the middle, that are, are letters, seven letters to seven different churches. And the, the beginning and the end are, are kind of focusing our eyes on who Jesus is, but this, this book is, is not meant to... We're going to be in Revelation 1, 1 to 8 this morning. So if you've got a Bible, if you want to flick to the first chapter of Revelation, it's the last book in the Bible. We're going to be looking at the first chapter of it and the first eight verses. I'm, I'm going to read it. We'll read it together in a moment. But it's, it's okay. We, we come to it in different ways. We can come to it as something that is, is scary something that is maybe confusing, something that's maybe hard to unpack and get into, something that maybe you've, you've read before and all you know of it is maybe that it causes debate and argument and division in kind of understanding. Actually, I, I think in these first eight verses, we catch a glimpse of what John really means for us to get out of this book and what what my and our prayer as, as elders is that we would get out of it, is that actually we would be wonderfully blessed by reading this book. So if, if you've got a Bible, we'll, we'll read uh, Revelation 1, verses 1 to 8. It says this, The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. 
To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Before we get into it, let's just let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for these words. Lord, I, I thank you for what a joy it is to read them and to see Jesus. Lord, I, I pray this morning that you would lift our eyes. Lord, you'd, you'd lift our eyes to see Jesus, to behold him in all his glory. Lord, to, to see him as the one who is, who was, and who is to come. The, the one to whom all glory is due, all worship and praise. Amen. Amen. So John tells us right from the beginning what he wants this, this letter to be, what he wants this book to, to kind of look at, its theme. It says in Revelation 1 verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is meant to reveal Jesus to us. If you want a summary of what Revelation as a book is meant to do, it's meant to reveal Jesus. It's meant to uncover, to unveil who he is and what he's done. It's meant to cause us to lift our eyes and to see him. It isn't meant to cause confusion. It isn't meant to hide things. It isn't meant to make them harder to understand. It's meant to cause us to see him with greater and increasing clarity. It's meant to uncover. That's what the, the word means. The, the word revelation here, the word John uses is the word apocalypsis. It's where we get our word apocalyptic from. Uh, the, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of the apocalypse is kind of the, it's an end of the world movie. That's, that's what it is. That's, that's kind of our idea of an apocalypse is there's some kind of weather catastrophe. Uh, the core of the earth has stopped spilling. Aliens have invaded. It, it's something, uh, Tom Cruise is usually involved. Like it's one of those <laughs> kinds of movies. That's, that's what we think of when we think of the apocalypse. Everything is coming to an end somehow. The, you know, the robots have turned against us. It's only a matter of time. But that's actually not what John means at all. The, the word apocalypsis here is, is, is the meaning of it is to unveil, to uncover. It, it's not meant to cause us to, to be scared. It's not even primarily meant to cause us to look ahead to the end and what is coming. It's meant to uncover Jesus. It's meant to reveal him to us. We're meant to see him after reading Revelation with greater clarity and awe. The unknown things are meant to be made known to us. The unseen things are meant to be revealed to us. So over the next 11 weeks, I want us to see Jesus with greater clarity, with our eyes lifted. This, this is not about stirring up debate. This is not about causing argument between when things are going to happen. That we want to see Jesus high and lifted up. It's that moment at the end of a, a, a movie with a great twist. I love a movie with a great twist at the end. It's like the end of The Wizard of Oz. When the curtain is pulled back and you see what was really going on the whole time. It's the end of the usual suspects. When you realize that Kaiser Soze was the main guy all along. If you've, I'm sorry, if you've not seen it, it came out in like the 90s. So I have no regret about ruining it for you, okay? If you've not seen it by now, you never will. But it changes our whole perception of what we looked at through the film because we know that actually he was the one in charge the whole time. The, the, the title of this morning's sermon is Revealing Reality. That's what Revelation does. It's meant to uncover, pull back this veil so that we can see what is really real. So that we can see what is really going on. 
so that we can lift our eyes above what we see in the immediate to see what is really true. 90s TV is making a comeback. I don't know if you know. Um, I don't know if anybody saw last night. You know, Gladiators is back. Yeah, it was so good. It's on BBC One Saturday nights. I, I don't know I did, if if you're old enough to remember the 90s. Saturday afternoon TV was was brilliant. Gladiators was like a staple. The the other one, and and the reason I bring it up is this is the conversation that I had with somebody this week. The the other one was Blind Date. I don't. I don't know if they've ever made that back, but in the 90s, that was, that was great. And, and the, the reason I was talking about it with someone is, is I was talking about this with them, and they went, oh, like Blind Date. I was like, what, are you, what? what do you mean? Like, so Blind Date is basically, if, if you haven't seen it, there was one contestant, one side of a big divide, and there were three people the other side, and they had to ask them questions and basically choose which one of them they wanted to, to take out afterwards. And Scylla Black was the host. And at the end, when they'd made their choice, they were, they kind of, fingers crossed, they were hoping, the wall would be retracted, and the person that they'd been talking to would be seen face to face. Uh, and then the reason that they said, oh, like Blind Date, is because for them that was what this was like, this, this pulling back of the wall. This, this seeing in all its fullness the thing that has been promised, the, the thing that has been spoken about, the, the thing that the Old Testament pointed to, that the Gospels was about, that Paul's letters said was going to happen again. And one day there will be a day where we see Jesus face to face, where the, the wall is taken back where the veil is lifted, where the curtains are opened, and we see Jesus in all his glory. John's letter in Revelation to the seven churches is, is our, our glimpse into that, is to not cause confusion, is to not cause division, is to not scare people thinking about the end, but to cause people to rejoice that what is ultimate reality is the sovereignty of God and the victory of Jesus. That's what we'll work through as we look through this book. John goes on in verse 3 to say this. He gives us again the, the point of his message, the point of this letter and what he wants people to get. He says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. There's blessing to be had. That that's, that's what it is that God wants us to take from these verses and these chapters in this book, is that we are to be blessed by what we read. We're to be blessed by them. We're to hear them. We're to read aloud this book. I encourage you to go home and read this book aloud. Because there's blessing in it. There's blessing in its words. But not only blessing in hearing it, not only blessing in reading it, but blessing in hearing what it says and doing it. There's, there's practical application to the book of Revelation for us today to walk in. There's things that we are to do. For, for some of us, there are things that we are to change. For some of us, there is great encouragement that the things we're doing are good and faithful. For some of us, we'll hear these, books, uh, these words from this book and think we, we are enduring in the trials and the, the sufferings that we're walking through. We are enduring. For some of us, there will be great challenge. For, for some of us, we'll hear the words in this book and think, I've, I've compromised in these areas. I've, I've allowed the world's perspective to creep in. I've, I've lost sight of what God says is true and what Jesus says is reality and where we're going. And I've, I've grabbed onto the promises and the fleeting pleasures that this world has to offer. I'm holding on to them as if they're true. And I need to let them go. I, I need to push them aside and I need to grab hold of what Jesus says is good and ultimate, and eternal. You see, this, this is a letter. 
This is a letter. This, this, isn't, this, this is a vision that John has that God gives him to reveal Jesus to him. But then he writes these seven letters to seven churches. And these seven letters to seven churches would have been sent out to these seven churches. And they would have been read by them. And they would have been greatly challenged by them. They would have been wonderfully encouraged. But there was, there was challenge in them as well. So we are to receive revelation in the same way that we receive Ephesians and Galatians and Timothy and Thessalonians and all, all of the other letters that were written to churches in the New Testament. We're, we're meant to, to not put revelation in a category all on its own. We're meant to include it in there. That revelation is, is written differently. You'll see that as we work through it. It, it is a, a different genre and style of writing. It will take thought to, to work that out and to, to navigate that. But in the same way as we read Ephesians, and we're wonderfully encouraged about the, su the supremacy and the worth of Jesus, but then challenged as it comes to looking at the, the, the role of, of men and women and what it is to be a parent and what it is to be a leader, we we're meant to read Revelation like that. Wonderfully encouraged, but challenged, but put it into practice. We're meant to take these words and we're meant to live them out. That Revelation is meant to change our perspective. That this is John's vision as the curtain is open and he lifts his eyes. It, it causes him and it should cause us to take a step back. The, the other illustration that I, I saw that was really helpful was to be overcome by the things of this world and to be weighed down by the things of life is like standing too close to a painting. When you stand too close to a painting, you may see every brushstroke. You may see every dot of paint. You may see every detail, but you only see it in a space about that big. And you think that that's everything that this painting is like. But then when you step back, when you lift your eyes, you see the canvas as a whole. You, you see the story that the painter was trying to convey. You see the glory, not in the, the detail of, a, of an inch square, but you see it in all its glory. You see that that was part of a bigger story and a bigger picture. You lift your eyes to see what was really going on. And sometimes we can stand too close. That we can be overcome by the things of this world. That all we see is, is the struggles and the temptations and the sufferings and the, the things that we're called to let go of that we just can't. And the things that we're meant to do and we just can't. And yet, when we take a step back, we are meant to see Jesus in all his glory. We're meant to see our lives as part of this wonderful canvas that ultimately was never about us, but was all about him. You see that we are brushstrokes on a huge painting, one that is all about his glory, the one in which he is the, the main and central character, the one that it is all about him. So we are, as we work through this book, stepping back, lifting our eyes, seeing the picture in its entirety, seeing what is ultimate reality, seeing what is true for them then and for us now. So John goes on in verse 4. And he says to the seven churches in Asia, blessed is those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it. So we know that it's meant to be sent out and received as a letter. We know that it's meant to lift and change our perspective. And then he goes on to say this, grace and peace to you from the one who was and is and is to come. That, that should 
be if, if we've read other letters in the Bible, if we have read other letters in the New Testament. If you haven't, you may not recognize that actually that's a, that's a fairly familiar way to start a letter. Grace and peace to you. That's how John starts this. Again, it's another indication that this is meant to be read and received as a letter to the churches. And grace and peace are used throughout the New Testament and in nearly all of the letters in it. So grace and peace start the letter of Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, although he he adds mercy to his, Titus, Philemon, 1 and 2 Peter, 2 John, Jude, and Revelation. I think that's quite repetitive in terms of starting letters. Given that most of them were written by Paul as well, you would have thought that you know, at some point someone would have said, could you, could, like, a bit of variety would be nice, like, to start a letter in another way. There are, there are other nice things that you could wish upon the church that you're writing to. You know, love and endurance to a church or, or mercy to a church. But he, he time and time again chooses deliberately to use the words grace and peace. And John uses grace and peace here to start his letter. It's very deliberate, done because grace is the ultimate and core of the gospel message. That we are not meant to read Revelation and think that there is anything we are to do on our own. We're not meant to read the blessings that Revelation has for us. We're not meant to read any of the promises that Revelation has for us. We're not meant to lift our eyes to Jesus and think, what do I have to do to obtain this? What do I have to work at to be able to see Jesus like this? That it is then, it was always before, and it has always been after a work of grace. The grace of God at work through Christ. John says it later on in this, uh, in this chapter. He says, uh, to the one who loves us, and has set us free from our sins by his blood. That's the Jesus that we're meant to see in Revelation. That's the grace at which we're meant to read this book with. We're meant to lift our eyes and see the one who has set us free from our sins by his blood. That there is still nothing we do. There is still nothing we do in order to earn the forgiveness and the favor and the blessing of God, that it is poured out on us as a gift of grace and mercy. Paul says it in one of his letters that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That John wants us to read Revelation with the gospel at our heart. That Jesus was made sin, was treated as if he had committed every sin, even though he himself was sinless and had never done anything wrong, in order that I would be treated with the righteousness of God. It's not through work. It's not through effort. It's through grace. So as we read through Revelation, we are still leaning our our salvation and our standing before God the Father on a work of grace, on the work of Jesus. And the next is peace, grace and peace. That as we start reading the book of Revelation, we're meant to read it with a sense of peace. The, the Hebrew words for peace and the word that the Jewish people would have used for peace is the word shalom. That word carries so much more meaning than when we think of peace. When we think of peace, we think maybe the absence of conflict, the absence of of war or fighting. You think of maybe when you get 10 minutes to yourself, when the house is empty and there's peace. 
That's, that's not what John means here. And that's, that's not what the Jewish people meant when they said the, the shalom of God, the peace of God, the peace that surpasses understanding. It calls it in the Bible. See, the, the, the peace that John talks about here, the, the peace that we see through the book of Revelation is the restoration of the peace that was lost in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, we read the story of God creating man and walking with him in the garden. Man not going with what God had instructed, thinking that he was going to do things on his own, turning his back from God, losing this peace. And Revelation is about uncovering and unveiling our eyes to the restoration and the restoring of that. Not peace in terms of an absence of war, although that is what it it entails, but a, a peace between man and God through and by the work of Jesus that we can know peace with God. There was a wonderful description I read of the the shalom of God, the peace of God, and it's described like this, the everything as it should be peace. That's what we see as we start to read Revelation, the blessing that comes, the unveiling. As we lift our eyes and we see Jesus, we start to get a sense of the everything as it should be, peace. The restoration of all things. I don't know where in life you need that everything as it should be peace. I don't know where in life it is that you're looking for it. We, we all want peace. We, we all want to find this, this joy, this lasting sense of, of being okay, of everything being all right. And we turn to anything that we hope will fill that need. We, we turn to anything that we think might grant us a sense of that peace. And for, for many, as we work through this book and we look at the seven churches, so many of them are looking for this peace, but in the wrong place. They're, they're thinking that it will be found in the promises that this world has to offer. That if we can work for this, or if we can achieve this, or if this person fulfills this need in us, then I'll know peace. It says in Ephesians 2.14, for he is our peace. That's what it says of Jesus. For he is our peace. He is our shalom. He is our peace with God. He is our everything as it should be, peace. That we are to lift our eyes and see him more and more. To know that he is the one that we are found in. To know that in this life there is nothing better we can do than pray. To know that there is nothing better we can do than worship. To know there is nothing better we can do than to endure. Because as we see Jesus, as we lift our eyes, as the veil is pulled back, that is what it causes us to do. To know that we are there because of the grace of God. There because of the blood of Jesus. Knowing that he has set us free from our sins by his blood. And now to know that we can experience the peace of God. So what is it that we hope to get out of this sermon series? What is it that in 11 weeks time we hope to hear from people? It isn't that we want to get to the end of these 11 weeks and be able for people to know every reference to the Old Testament that there is in the book of Revelation. 
It's not that we want to get to the end and for everyone to know what the, the different images and metaphors and pictures mean. That they can know what the different numbers used in Revelation allude to. Because this is, this is um, what somebody said. There's, there's, in our companion guide, there are some wonderful resources for us to look through and for you to use as we study this book. But in one of them, a book called Blessed, uh, written by a woman called Nancy Guthrie, she says that if, if at the end of her book, you can, you can do all those things. If at the end of the, her book, you can, you can reference every Old Testament image, if you can know every number, you can know every metaphor, but you are still enamored by the promises of this world. If you are still clinging to the things that this world has to offer as your hope and your peace, then you have missed the blessing that Revelation holds. You've missed the reason why John has written it. You've missed the thing that we see when we lift our eyes to Jesus. Because what John wants us to do and what our prayer is for this sermon series is that we would see more of this. This is the last half of this chapter. The one who was and is and is to come. The faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead. The ruler of the kings of the earth. The one who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. The one who made us a kingdom and priests. The one to whom all glory and dominion is forever and ever. The one who is coming on the clouds, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. That's who we want you to see. We want you to be blessed by seeing Jesus. We want our eyes lifted. It's not that we can study this book and know all the information that it holds if at the end of the day we don't see the Lamb standing as if slain. We don't want to fill our heads with knowledge if we still run to the Babylon that this world is instead of the glory that is held in Christ. We don't want to fill our heads with with things we can know if we are still desperately searching for our peace in something that this world has to offer and not finding it in its fullness in Jesus. I want us to get to the end of this series and be excited about the day we see him coming on the clouds. Excited about the day we get to pull a chair up to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Excited about the day when we look him face to face, eye to eye, and he wipes every tear. When everything that has hurt has been put right. When we know a piece of everything as it should be. When we see the one seated at the right hand of the Father. See, because if we can make a good argument, if we can win a debate, and if we can recite knowledge, but we don't see him as he is, we've missed the blessing of Revelation. I want us to see Jesus. I want us to be enamored by him. I want us to look out on this world and know that there is nothing here that will satisfy me. There is nothing here that I will put my hope in or find my peace in. That my hope and my peace are found in the work of Jesus. That there is nothing better than worship. That there is nothing more useful than prayer. That I can endure through any hardship. There's a, a cry that the, the Christian puts out in Revelation. And the, the cry is, how long, O Lord? And that's in reference to people suffering and being persecuted for their faith. How long, O Lord, until you put things right? The reason they cry that is because they've been so... They know that this world will not comfort them. They've been so discontent by the comfort that this world has to offer that their cry is, how long, O Lord, before we find our comfort fully in you? That that is what this book is for. That that is what this book is about. To uncover, unveil, and to see Jesus. To be blessed by it. 
to know that he is our hope and our peace. To see him high and lifted up, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the one who has set us free from our sins, the one who has made us a kingdom and priest, the one who is coming on the clouds. That's the Jesus that we see. I get the band to, to come up. We're going to respond as we finish in worship. I'd love for us as we, as we do, as we worship together, just to, to lift our eyes. To, to maybe open ourselves up in prayer to seeing Jesus. This, this series and this book calls us to do some work. To cause us to, to evaluate things that we hold dear and true. It calls us to endure. So as we start it, and as we start looking at what these passages promise and speak of, let's come in worship this morning. Let's pray that our hearts would be ready to receive. That our hearts would not be hardened to change. That we would see and hold on to the things of Jesus and call us to to turn our backs where we need to, to be encouraged where we need encouragement, to be challenged where we need challenge, to know that he is our peace. So we stand together? The, the band are going to lead us in worship. If you're, a, if you're a parent, if you've got kids upstairs, if you want to go and get them now during this song so that they're back for the baptisms... Let me just pray as we, as we respond in worship. Father, I thank, you for, I thank you for this vision of Jesus that John has. Lord, I thank you that it lifts our eyes to the one who is coming on the clouds. Lord, the one who one day every eye will see. I thank you for this unveiling. Lord, I pray that as we work through this book, we would see Jesus with greater clarity. We would see Jesus with greater joy. Lord, we would see him as he's meant to be seen with the, the wool pulled back, the, the veil lifted, the curtain drawn, Lord, that we would see him as he is. Lord, and it would cause us to rejoice, that we would worship, that we would come and we would lay everything down before him. Amen.